But let's remember, if the leadership wants to do something, they have all the tools at their disposal. And I don't think that they will want to underwrite massive unemployment. I think the Chinese leadership wants stability above all. So I will not rule out any kind of stimulus. And perhaps they would look different than in the past. They will not go through the property market. But it could well happen that you will see greater lending, perhaps in you know, select industries like autos or semiconductors, whatever it might be. But I've seen so many cycles at this point. I started investing in China in 2008, and 2007 was a boom, 2010 another boom, 2013 was a, a low in the Asian market. It felt very much like today. I would go to these conferences and, and meet uh, local investors, and they were so just so despondent. And I feel very much the same kind of sentiment today. Uh, they just, you know, people say they, there's nothing, they can't see anything positive, and that's fine, but we can't predict the future. Welcome to Analyze Asia, the premier podcast dedicated to dissecting the pulse of business technology and media in Asia. I'm Bernard Leong, and happy Chinese New Year with the dragon roaring again. How should we look at the Chinese stock market or even the entire Asian stock market at this critical juncture? With me today, Michael Frizzo, founder of Asian Century Stocks, to the show and help us to decipher the market. But before we go on, note that this is not investment advice, legal advice, or even life advice. The material here is definitely for educational purposes and should not be used to evaluate any financial decisions. And we may also have holdings of some of the stocks that may be discussed here. So with all that gone away, Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Bernard. Yes, and I chanced upon your Substack newsletter while doing some research on Asian stocks. And so that was how we got and then basically reached out to you and you're kind enough to give me this interesting interview but to really start off i want to know your origin story how did you start your career well yeah thanks for inviting me first of all i i'm i'm a swedish citizen born in switzerland but i spent the last almost 20 years outside of sweden and most of that time in asia so i ended up here and through through a circuitous route it wasn't obvious at the time you know when i graduated that i would end up here but i suppose my, my first job was in journalism and almost now come full circle now. I'm writing this publication called Asian Century Stocks, which is a newsletter focusing on the Asia Pacific on the Substack platform, which is kind of journalism, uh, financial journalism, that is. And I my first job happens to be in journalism back when I was 15 years old. And I happened to get a job with the second largest newspaper in Sweden, where I come from. And I would be on the back side of that newspaper every second week or so with my face on that, me writing editorials so anything related to youth culture. So I suppose um, that inspired me to come back to that area in, in writing full time, which I'm doing now. But, but after that, I, I did study economics and, and finance. My first job out of a university, uh, doing a few summers in London, working for different financial institutions, was mm. working for a, a bank. And I was in corporate finance first few years, doing M&A and also capital markets transactions, specifically for transport infrastructure. So every in investment banking or corporate finance departments, you would have different teams. And my most of the time, I was covering transport then, partly on, on for third parties, but also for private equity funds of the same group that I was working for. And so, so that was my start to the finance industry. And, and that was in the mid 2000s. I should also mention that in between, I got a taste of living in this part of the world by studying at in India, of all places. Oh. I did an exchange student program in Bangalore, in Karnataka, mm. in southern India. And it was a fascinating experience uh, that kind of left me wanting for more. So mm. I think that was probably the spark that made me, you know, look towards this part of the world. And uh, yeah. So how did you eventually come to Asia, given that you have spent such a significant amount of time over 10 years here? What are your perspectives on the region, give, given your current thing of covering the financial aspect of the Asian market? Well, the reason why is that I studied some Chinese in Europe and I did a career break in mid-career, let's speak. And I went to Beijing, studied mostly at, at Peking University, studying Chinese. Mm. Mm. So I spent a year doing that and I absolutely loved it. I, I loved the challenge 
of learning a new language and entering a new world with this knowledge of, of, of the language knowledge that I accumulated. So that was, that's what happened. And, and after that year, I was lucky enough to get a position working for an emerging market fund based out of Shanghai. And so they, they had two funds at the time. I was covering mostly Chinese companies. And my job was to be the analyst on the ground, traveling around the region, uh, meeting company management teams, and, and both finding new investments for the funds, but also keeping track of existing investments. And so those years, it was basically a lot of traveling, a lot of liaising with the portfolio manager at the time and thrown into the deep end of the water. I don't know if that's how you say it, but yeah, that's what yeah. it felt like. So I think you have a very interesting career journey. You came from Europe, then India, China, and now Singapore, right? That's right. So what are the lessons you can share with my audience about your career journey? Well, I've gone from, from different jobs laterally. I came to Singapore with a family office, managing the fortune of a single family. And they had a large portion of their wealth here in, in Asia, in Southeast Asia specifically. So I'm not sure whether my career is necessarily a model for how one should do it. But I suppose interest is a key thing. And also finding a something that's a match, I suppose, with what you're good at and what you think you can actually make a difference. One career advice that I wish I would have taken more to heart, perhaps, is you find a mentor that you really admire and that you want to emulate. And then you're loyal to that person. And throughout your career, he will probably be your protector in that organization. I think that's really important to create these allies higher up in the hierarchy and and to learn from, because I think that's a career advice that's important. I, I also think that if you come out of the, one of these big famous business school or big economics program in Europe, there's a temptation to go into consulting or investment banking. And, and maybe those are, are fine routes, but I think there's also no need to be too afraid of going your own route because you can make money, frankly, in every, every industry. And I think if I would look back from when I was a student, a graduate student, I think I went the conventional path but ended up somewhere else. I could have just gone for what I was passionate about perhaps writing. And that I'm sure that would have worked out fine. Don't be too worried about your career at that stage. Mm. That's a sound advice. And I want to come to the main subject of the day. I probably wanted to understand how is it to think about the Asian stock market with your point of view. So I want to kick off first with something that is pretty uh, happening much in the Asian stock market last week. So we kick off the year of the dragon. There was a turbulent stock tanking last week in the China equities, which I think at one point dropped, I think about 37% from the all-time high. So what just happened? Well, uh, I think we it's helpful to think of the Chinese stock markets as two different halves. You have the domestic stock market, which is RMB denominated, and local investors, they think a little bit differently. And the Asian markets, local stock markets, Shanghai, Shenzhen primarily, they are... They, they work a little bit differently because of liquidity within China is different from liquidity outside. And foreigners buying Chinese shares are think differently as well. So Hong Kong and US markets are a little bit different. So for the local market, what really matters is liquidity factors. And liquidity with that, I mean, credit growth. If there's not enough credit, if there's not enough lending, money will come out of the stock market, typically. Um, there's just a shortage of money. There has been a shortage of money. And since 2017, China has had this deleveraging campaign and credit growth has slowed down, probably for, for le le legitimate reasons. But there's also been a, a campaign run from the top where, where Xi Jinping and the general office or the people in Zhongnanhai, they, they're they trying to restrict credit growth and prevent the disorderly expansion of capital, as they call it, which to some people might imply that you don't want the you don't want capital to go to inefficient places or you know to in unproductive uh, endeavors and perhaps they don't want cap credits to go to the people who are not aligned with the communist party that's another mm. part of it. the party wants to make sure that everyone is aligned with their goals of whatever they call it national re rejuvenation but this i think yeah, this hasn't had an impact because if you have someone a genius like jack ma resign they will obviously have a long-term impact, I think, on the business. 
Mm. So that that's part of it. I mean, that happened in, in 2020, and we're now over three years after that. Mm. So it's been a long bear market. I think in there's also been a crackdown on property developers. That's a whole another issue. They mm. basically cut them off from credit. They're diff finding it difficult to to roll over their loans, and suddenly they are going bankrupt. They're defaulting on their offshore debts, and that means that they're going to be restructured through this new bankruptcy law. But there's also some uncertainty as to what's going to happen to uh, to those developers. Some people see this as a soft nationalization. Maybe you will end up with only or mostly pro state-owned property developers. And then the question is, if this happens to property development and tech, will it happen to other markets as well, other industries like finance, for example, or financial services? So there's a lot of fear. And I think we had a almost a bottom. It felt like a bottom back in October 2022 when Xi Jinping, he had a third term and he stacked the Politburo Standing Committee with his own people. And that really, I think, caused investors to become very cautious because it, it suddenly dawned on them that Xi Jinping was forever. And these crackdowns that we've seen are going to continue potentially forever. Some people see parallels with Joseph Stalin, you know, who had this concept of forever revolution. So I think that's really the fear. And we've seen since October 2022, there's been a hope mm. that there will be some kind of rebound in consumer confidence. And there was. And certain sectors, such as restaurants, the service industry, and transport industry, has really recovered quite nicely. But at the same time, the property market is weak. Construction is down. New starch, residential new starch, are down like 60%. And that has led to uh, consumer confidence, I think, being very weak. Unemployment rising. And with rising unemployment, you get lower spending on, uh, you know, autos and property itself and such. So, mm. so that's really what so, happened. Yeah. And just to tie yeah. into, you know, you, you asked about the last few weeks. I think we've now reached another, just we call it puke, you know, mm. puke market, which means <laughs> that people are so fed up, they just they just sell whatever they have left now because they are so so tired and they don't see any end yeah. to this. I just happen to have a different view personally. Um, Not advice, but we can talk about that more. No, it's interesting you mentioned that. And of course, in the construction market, one of my surprises, because I, I observed the Chinese market was something at maybe Evergrande was pretty much overinflated. But in the case of Century Garden, which is supposed to be like the most sort of obedient, it's also ended up in trouble as well with their... Uh, construction properties as well. So, so I, that that actually drives a lot of fear, and also there is the declining population, and then now China, one of the things that the Chinese government is encouraging is to try to basically increase back their population because of the population decline. One thing that after that whole puking happened last week, then the Chinese government did step in into the stock market. What do they actually do? Well, they have been trying this so-called plunge protection team where they ask institutions to not sell shares or potentially lend to them to acquire shares. And to what extent that has, uh, has already happened, I'm not completely sure. Mm. But rumors that Xi Jinping is meeting with the regulators, uh, with the PBOC, but whether that's actually going to have an impact, I'm not sure. I think there's a lot of talk about that on a day-to-day -day basis and stocks will go up on a single day based on these rumors, especially the Asian investors, they're famously uh, sensitive to all of these kind of policy rumors. And I think that's that's interesting, but what really matters is liquidity, lending. And, and frankly, last two months, we've seen a real improvement in liquidity, interbank liquidity in China. And so in a typical banking system, including in China's, you have reserves, Banks have reserves with the central bank, the PBOC, and then when they lend, they set aside reserves. Some of that loan is set aside as reserves. So by increasing the total reserves, you can increase the potential lending in the economy. And it's just so happened that January total social financing numbers, the, the broad money supply is actually very strong in January this year. So it looks like the conditions are there for a, a rebound in, in lending, and that's that might have a negative impact on the currency, but it's actually really positive for shares. And to me, this looks a little bit like 2016, when 
there was a slight devaluation in August 2015, and then there was a liquidity injection, and also I think broader credit growth through high mortgage lending and such. So uh, the thing is, the Chinese economy is very weak, and that's obvious when you had construction being almost 30% of the economy, and suddenly it's kind of imploding due to uh, a restriction of lending. But let's remember, if the leadership wants to do something, they have all the tools at their disposal. And I don't think that they will want to underwrite massive unemployment. I think the Chinese leadership wants stability above all. So I will not rule out any kind of stimulus. And perhaps it would look different than in the past. It will not go through the property market. But it could well happen that you will see greater lending, perhaps in you know, select industries like autos or semiconductors, whatever it might be. But I've seen so many cycles at this point. I started investing in, in, in China in 2008. And you know 2007 was a boom. 2010, another boom. 2013, there was a, a low in the Asian market. It felt very much like today. You know, I would go to these conferences and, and meet uh, local investors, and they were so just so despondent. And I feel very much the same kind of sentiment today. Uh, they just, you know, people say they, there's nothing, they can't see anything positive, and that's fine. But we can't predict the future. And if you've seen cycles every three to five years, I think it's safe to say there will probably be another cycle again, most likely. Hmm. You you mentioned you have a very different perspective to what this is happening. Are you thinking that there, there may be a rebound and then there is a recovery to maybe not to the all-time high or is, or maybe there are some indicators that tell you that maybe something is going to change on that front? I think you mentioned some of these potential changes that might come in at this point in time, or should we just be pessimistic about it? Well, it's it's very hard to guess what's going to happen to a broader index. It partly depends on what's in that index. What are the largest constituents? But cycles could can happen. And it, it all depends on liquidity, like I said. The current situation in China reminds me a little bit of Japan, frankly. And many there have there been some comparisons between Japan, China, in terms of the size of the property industry, 1989 Japan versus China. Mm. It's safe to say, of course, when construction implodes the way it is doing, it, it will have to have a negative impact on the economy. But you can deal with such problems by socializing them, by printing money, essentially. Or you can have deflation, debt deflation, like we had in the Great Depression in the United States in the 1930s. That's another day, way to deal with deal with the problem, problems of leverage, just bankruptcy, basically or you can inflate your weight out of those problems. And which route China is going to take is unclear. One is positive for shares, other one is positive for bonds. And so it, it's hard to say, I can't really say that. I made, I wrote a post a few months ago, uh, sorry, a few days ago about Hong Kong. And I, I suppose generalizing this way is not necessarily helpful. There are always pockets of opportunity. So if you own, I mean, certain companies like God knows what, like NetEase or whatever, they might do well, even though there is a, let's say, implosion in the property market. Even in Japan, I mean, there are some companies like Uniqlo, they've done amazingly the past 30 years. So I sometimes think that media is a little bit, you know, categorical in their assessments mm -hmm. of stocks or, or companies. There are always positives and negatives. And I think personally, if on a macro view, people are very negative, that's probably the time to look for these jewels of companies or trends. Of course, in, in bad times, there are always opportunities. So I'm going to switch the conversation out of China for a while and just take a um, high-level high overview of the Asian stock market based on today's market capitalization baseline. So, um, can you just sort of give a high-level view on where the Asian stock market is in maybe including China as compared say, to the other regions, say the US and the Euro. I know US is probably the biggest stock market, but how where's the Asian stock market now? Well, I think one key thing to note is that there is a huge amount of companies listed in, in Asia. Absolutely massive. And it's a very diverse region. I mean, you know, of course, my publication is known as Asian Century Stocks. I, I cover this diverse region. 
But to make no mistake, I mean, India versus Japan, those are completely different regions with different cultures, and the economies are, are also very different in their makeup. So I suppose that's one, one point I want to make. Broadly speaking, I suppose that East Asia is different in the fact that it's relatively wealthy, including China, increasingly so. And they've become wealthy through export of light manufactured goods. And they've gone through this process, almost the only region in the world that's really become richer over the past 100 years, thanks to education, but also the container and the, the ease of outsourcing of manufacturing capacity from Europe and US to this part of the world, where there's a hardworking uh, population and also ed highly educated and highly skilled. And uh, the conditions were there for Japan and you know, later Korea, Taiwan, now mm. China, Vietnam, to take the mantle in terms of assembly and later on, you know, higher value add manufacturing. So East Asia is that. It's a highly liquid market. Tons of companies listed in, in Japan, and I suppose it's almost 3,000 tons of companies. The whole region, over 10,000, if you count all these small companies as well. I think in the US, less than 3,000. So there's a lot of opportunities. And East Asia, a little bit more innovative. There's more manufacturing there. Manufacturing is, is almost like it can be seen as a warrant on growth in, in the West. So that works its own way. I mean, those countries, I think, are a little bit different. Southeast Asia, is those markets are very illiquid, and they tend to go through boom-bust patterns. Right now, they're out of favor. Nobody wants to invest in Southeast Asia these days, almost. Even mm -hmm. locals that I, you know, that I speak to in Indonesia, they don't want to invest in Indonesia. They want to invest in the US, in Tesla or, or Nasdaq. So Southeast Asia tends to have uh, greatest cycles, I think, when investors participate and when they don't. And right now, Southeast Asia is very inexpensive. Volumes are low, valuations are low. Typically, since the markets are so small as well, the indices or the largest companies tend to be banks, property developers, maybe telecom companies or miners. Mm. There's not much export. A lot of the exports that Southeast Asia has is really tourism or natural resources. So there are different types of companies that you would typically look at. And though in every market, you have consuming companies, of course. But the market is not really of interest to global institutional investors because there's just not many to choose from in each, each of these markets. Whereas Hong Kong, Japan, highly liquid markets. So it's easier for them to invest in them. Now, India is a different one because it's hard to... It's hard to invest as a foreigner into India. And for example, Interactive Brokers, a popular brokerage platform, they only offer access to non-resident Indians. And personally, I don't cover that cover that market that much. And but people find it interesting because they think that manufacturing will move to India at some point. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure how much that will move the needle for, for the country, but this been it's an interesting market in its own right because of Modi's reforms. So what is the inspiration behind Asian Century Stocks, what you now write on and what's the, actually your mission and vision to try to help people to understand the Asian stock market? Well, I think uh, the inspiration came from the United States. And I suppose during COVID, I saw the success of Substack newsletters in the United States. There's one called mm -hmm. Vision, doing restructurings and rule of companies. There's also another one called The Bear Cave, a young guy mm -hmm. in Francisco who runs that. Also very successful. And I suppose I saw that the model worked. And the key there is that if you write online, another additional subscriber doesn't cost anything. Mm. So that could lead to pure profits. And with scale, it can potentially become profitable. My scale is, is still relatively small, but over time, you know, you can grow that. And, and to me, that was an attractive business model. And I also felt that there, there's a lack of, of information outside of the newspapers. There are some newspapers who do a good job, like The Edge, for example. But overall, <clears throat> I think that there's not much out there. And I, I felt that yeah. I could probably provide that perspectives and guide. I mean, not necessarily guide, but just talk about different trends. And I think that people, I'm writing what I, I would like to read myself, hmm. basically as an investor or someone who's just interested in companies in, in the region. And, and I think that there's also a case to be made that if you're based somewhere else, it's interesting to know what are the parallels of what we're seeing 
in the US, for example, in China. Mm. Uh, and so trying to open up people's minds in a way. Yeah. Mm. So who are the intended audience for the Asian Century stocks? Are these people who are like family officers or funds out there or fund managers out there or people who are actually interested in participating in the stock market in Asia? Yeah, I mean, they, they are a mix of, of private investors or hobby investors, let's speak, or there are some institutional investors. Now, I don't provide investment advice. I only talk about facts and, and uh, talk more in a you know, broad sense. But I suppose they are fairly sophisticated investors. And I, t- I talk things, I talk about things in a fairly high level. So I don't target necessarily retail investors. They tend to be quite people who have been in the industry or are currently in the finance industry and are just looking for something thought-provoking. Mm. I, I thought one interesting thing is when I was going through Asia Century stocks, when I discovered it, I, I showed that I saw a couple of different types of information that you provide for your subscribers, like say thematic reports, the portfolio and deep dives. Do you have some sense like how would people would in, in turn utilize and maybe apply that information that you provided? Well, I think that, sorry. No, I think as investors, people like to broaden their views. Mm. And I like to talk about companies and things that nobody else really talks about. Mm. And they, for example, if I write about the, let's, let's think of a topic. Let, I, talk, I wrote about the cosmetics industry. Mm. with face masks being removed. And that actually helps with certain types of cosmetics, color cosmetics in particular. And I think people haven't really thought about that. Uh, and uh, just mentioning that in an email, I think leads to sparks. And uh, then they, they, they will perhaps start looking at cosmetics companies mm. in that light. So I think that's how you would look at, you know, use some of those thematic reports. Now I want to talk about facts. People make their own, you know, own mind about what the implications are of particular trends. Now, deep dives, those are, the, are on particular companies and that I find particularly interesting. Mm. And the, the purpose there is to talk about companies that perhaps aren't talked about as, as much. And as investors, you want to build up your knowledge base bit by bit about this and that company. And over time, it gives you a greater opportunity set then for them mm. to think through, you know, should I do more research on this or that? So that that's really the idea. I also disclose, you know, what I personally own. People can make, you know, can can do what they want with that. But yeah, and I also talk about sometimes. I also talk about other interesting content that I read. So in a way, I feel like the publication is a funnel in a way, sparking ideas and and for them to yeah to to you know to take the research further. But I'm really just the first part of that funnel. And mm. uh, certainly, you so, know, if, if people do want to invest, they should always speak to their financial advisor because those are the ones who are experts and know how to make particular mm. investments. Yeah. So if I'm a new investor and who wants to build an Asian portfolio, going through your blog is, has, a, has given me some thoughts on it as well. What would be the things that I need to watch out for? Well, from a personal point of view, I think, I mean, Singapore is a little bit special because you got the HTB system, but I think it's always good to have a home. I mean, that's. I'm not, I'm not talking about now from a very basic point of view. You have a certain capital. What are you going to do with it? Perhaps owning a home through the BTO process, for example, or if you live somewhere else with freehold property, buying that property with a lot of leverage makes a lot of sense because it will gain value with inflation. And with leverage, you get this leverage effect. You get even greater returns on your deposit then. So that's those tend to be safe. And, and reasonable, I think, long-term investment for many people. A freehold property with leverage, that is, or BTOs in Singapore. But, and then I think for most people, they are, they are not professionals. It really is a minefield. I mean, if you were to invest in NVIDIA or, or Tesla, understanding those, com- those stocks better than the professionals, very difficult thing to do. And the risk is that you read something in the press, you think that's exciting for some reason, and everybody else thinks it's, it's exciting mm. too. So you end up buying almost towards the end of the cycle of, of people you know, getting into it. And then if there's some kind of flaw being exposed, they're all going to exit at the same time. Very dangerous. So 
personally, if you ask me personally, I would say to most people, just diversify, you know, speak to your financial advisor and make sure that you have a portfolio that's really well diversified mm -hmm. because most people really cannot guess what's going to happen. But if you're diversified, at least you'll protect yourself a little bit from inflation. And, you know, you will, it's a safe way to, to keep that money that you worked so hard for. So that's, you know, once you own a home, perhaps I would do that. And for people who are interested in investing, it's probably a pretty good idea to start small. Like if you do want to speculate or buy individual shares, that, that tends to be quite dangerous perhaps and, and quite difficult and perhaps best to speak to the advisor before doing that. But in any case, starting small is a really good idea because you will learn what's working and not working. That's It takes a long time to figure out what the pitfalls are. And I can tell you, but it, it won't be the same unless you've done it yourself and you've seen what could happen. Because even if I tell you that there are frauds in, let's say, Vietnam or wherever, you, you will still you know, not know what to do with that information until you learn to calibrate you know, what companies are dangerous or not. Mm. So what's the one thing you know about the Asian stock market that very few do? I think that the main thing is that it's, it's about the characters of the people you're dealing with, the, the decision makers. Like, it's a fact. Emerging markets, you really cannot rely on the legal system. Like If they want to cheat you, they will cheat you. Trust me, there are a million ways they can cheat you. So it makes a lot of sense to just go through, look at the person in charge and what have they done in the past? Like, how did they make the wealth? Did they make it by adding value to consumers? Did they make it by perhaps some kind of connection in the government, leading them to have some a, a scarce license or resource? Or uh, did, they, did they make the money by cheating investors, for example? That's also possible. And... If you do that research and you speak to locals and understand what their reputation is like, perhaps you'll avoid investing in certain companies. So I think if you don't have laws to protect you, character is really all there is to rely on. And and so, and I think that if you go to Jakarta, you go to Manila, you speak to people, you will figure out that, yeah, this person you can trust, this person is not, you cannot trust. Mm -hmm. And that is a, such a huge value add because even if the company you invest in is a crappy company, a shipping company, whatever, if you have someone solid in charge, they can make good transactions happen. They can add value in various ways and they won't cheat you. So I think that's really number one in these you know, quite hazardous markets. I the first article I actually read from your site was something was an article called Fraud in Asia. I really liked it. It's very concise, it explains the strengths and the weaknesses of a book called Asian Financial Stock Analysis. Surprisingly, someone gave it to me as a present by Tan Chi, from his mentor, who is Tan Chin Rui. Mm. So, and Thomas Robinson. So one of the things that I really enjoy reading is you mentioned quite various methods uh, that companies use to commit fraud, like overstating earnings or even like you know, managing earnings as well. Can you share some insights on how these fraudulent practices differ in the Asian markets as maybe compared to, say, the Western markets as such? Yeah, right. So I think, let's say the United States, because countries are all, all quite different, but in the United States, let's say, I think the it's very common to have high share price compensation, especially in these biotechs or tech companies, software companies. That's what you should look out for. In the market cap companies in the United States, I think there are a lot, a lot of dilution, you know, a lot of share issues, that are just diluting minority shareholders into oblivion to fund expenses, you know. For, for microcaps, they don't have the money to pay for salaries, let's say, so they will <laughs> dilute you that way. That's what you should look out for. Whereas in Asia, I think there are two main problems. One is cash hoarding, and that's especially prevalent in Japan and Korea. Families, they tend to think that the listed company is theirs. It's almost like their treasure sh chest. And as a minority shareholder, you come there as a foreigner, you know, I go there with a, you're, you know, with a white face and you, they will look at you and say, they don't think that you're equal, of course, obviously, and they're mm -hmm. in control as well. So you have really have no bargaining power. And the, I've tried to go on activist a few times before in East Asia, and it's just, it's extremely hard. It's just, 
So cash hoarding is almost the norm in Korea, Japan, maybe Hong Kong as well, to some extent. That's a huge issue. So capital allocation, capital is not allocated efficiently. It's not paid out as dividends. They're not buying back shares or they're not investing it intelligently. They're just putting it on the balance sheet and letting it accumulate. Mm -hmm. That's not good for long-term returns. That's not leading to, you, you don't get compounders that way. So that's one issue. And to deal with that, I think you need to find people who are uh, thinking rationally from a minority investor's point of view. For example, you do buybacks. If you, you see buybacks in Japan, huge positive. And there are companies who do that these days. Uh, in emerging Asia, I think it's more common to have complex corporate structures. And by that, I mean a parent company that has actual operating assets and then they might send cash to that parent company through related party transactions. Or maybe they have a sister company that's owned by the parent that has the operating assets as well. And then they have, let's say, the majority of the employees employed with that sister company. And then they don't show up in the accounts. They're not consolidated in the, to the accounts of the listed company. So it looks like they're really profitable, high margins, but in fact, they're, you know, once every two years, they send money to the sister company to pay for the salaries, things like that. Extremely common. And you can, it's not that easy to figure out what the corporate structure is, but you can, related part of the transactions are sometimes disclosed, sometimes mm. not. But if you dig a little bit, you can find warning signs. Mm. So like, what are the key indicators that investors need to look out for when evaluating, say, corporate governance in Asia companies? Is it mainly just looking at just some of those things that you were talking about? I suppose so. I mean, there are also balance sheets and or accounting items that you can look at. And Tanner Robinson's book is fantastic. You know, read mm. that book. It's, it will give you an eye-opener. What's yeah. going on in the region and how to, you know, what to think about when investing in, in some of these markets. It will, because it is so important, right? If corporate governance, it really d determines success, I think. It should mm. be your number one priority for any investments, I think, personally. That's my personal view, at least. Mm. But in terms of indicators, I think the key thing there is looking at the balance sheet, looking at how fast it's growing. Is it growing much faster than the than revenues, This the scale of the business? Because if it is, you could see that could show up in different ways. But typically, when a balance sheet grows really fast, that's a sign that there's accounting manipulation going on. And the reason for that is because the, the balance sheet has to balance. So if you do get earnings going up, something has to happen on, on the other asset side or the liability side. And the most simple fraud is you sell a good to someone and then they don't pay you. And that someone is your friend. So let's say that I'm a fraudulent company. I just pretend that I give you, sell you the product and you get accounts receivable from that person. And there's no money changing hands. Now you can record that it's a high margin revenue because you did actually didn't. Well, you can you can you can say what your margins are, what you know. You can make that up, and it would be recorded as revenues and profits. And so, what will happen to the balance sheet? It will grow. You will have accounts receivable that's not collected. And if a company is fraudulent, of course they don't have to write that down either. So that's mm -hmm. a, that's the most simple simplest fraud. You can have the balance sheet growing in different ways higher inventories, you can have weird securities, which are long-term in nature. So that's number one. I think complex corporate structure, I mentioned that. If you can figure mm -hmm. out that, let's say that half of cost of goods sold comes from the parent, or half of sales goes through distributors owned by the parent. I mean, that opens up the scope for pricing, which is not market-based. Basically, yeah, they can set the prices wherever they want and then shift profits from the list code to the parent. So complex corporate structure is also another one. I like to have a chart with, I like to hmm. show people a chart where you see, uh, yeah, this is the parent, this is the list code, and there's not much, you know, the, the parent is just, oh, you know, it could be just pure ownership or a lot more complex. In, in Korea, for example, some of these tables have extremely complex structures. Yeah, that's right. And, so, yeah, and, okay. and I have a few more. I suppose high margins, if they're really high and they're selling you like a commodity product, like pipes or whatever, huge issue. Like 30% margins for selling pipes, probably not true. 
And then uh, finally, I think something that I like to look at is, is cash flows. Like if you see hmm. operating cash flows being zero or negative while profits are, ne are positive, oh, don't touch that thing because <laughs> most likely those profits are not real. <laughs> I, I I I totally agree with you because I was attend. I actually spent some time attending the Singapore Institute of Directors about how to be a board member, and then one of my favorite course is the one on reading financial statements for eight hours. Is the first thing they tell you: don't look at the first page. Start reading the second page onwards, which is mm -hmm. what you just mentioned. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Yeah. I want to to talking about short sellers because I think this is one of the, the conversations that I have. I mean, one of the things I, I which I agree with you, I think that they are necessary evil, despite they have an agenda. I saw some really good short sellers doing very detailed exposure for companies. I covered the Lucking Coffee, which was by an unknown group. And recently there was the Adani group by Hindenburg Research. Can you Elaborate on the role of and influence of short sellers in the Asian uh, financial stock markets. How did they actually influence the investors in terms of placing bets? Well, I suppose with there have been a few cycles back in 2010, 2011. It was a huge wave of, of reports coming out on, on, on Chinese listed primarily, so US listed Chinese companies. And I think at the time, China was, there was a BRICS bubble, if you want to call it that, a BRICS yep. boom. People were, were re really into Chinese equities and they wanted to have exposure and they provided that exposure. At that time, most of these companies were physical businesses and they were, it, it was easy for them, for short sellers to send in people to China to count the number of lorries going in and out, for example, of a factory or to get information from filings from the government, SCIC filings, and figure out whether or not the, the numbers uh, make sense or not. And so it was easy for them at that time to, to go after frauds, specifically in China, but not exclusively, of course, also in other parts of emerging Asia. So th they've had a huge impact. And I think it's, since then, it's become more difficult to undertake such frauds. We've seen more frauds being in the online realm because it's easy to fake data online, but perhaps also a, a reduction in the number of companies coming, coming to markets. Of course, there are always frauds everywhere, exceptionally, especially when you have these strong markets like we had today. People become gullible. They are focusing on certain themes, like whatever it might be of the they used to be people used to be very interested in the 3D printing, whatever. Now it's perhaps AI yeah. stocks or such. But so they've had a very positive influence. And the, the fact is, I think that in large parts of Asia, there's just no not much media coverage. Uh, and I'm, I mentioned the edge, and they've done an amazing job, but yeah. there's not much media coverage, and especially not this kind of negative media coverage. There are defamation laws that prevent people from from voicing their opinions. And increasingly, I think media is being restricted in their efforts to 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 out frauds you know i mentioned in that post that south china morning post they wrote a they kind of outed a fraud and, and that doesn't happen very often in this part of the world whereas i think financial times in london they do more of that kind of reporting uh, so instead we've had short sellers and personally i have the greatest respect for them because they spend months doing on the ground research expending significant resources to figure out the truth. And of course, they are selling the shares themselves. And they are, there's money to be made, of course. But everybody has an incentive, insiders as well. And I'm hoping that there be more short sellers because they will weed out the, the crap in the markets and, and mm. the greater quality of companies remaining. Mm. I, I agree with you because I remember the Lucking Coffee, the expose, they actually went to even look at the receipts of one entire coffee chain and try to work out how many deliveries are there. One of the things I, I enjoy reading those reports by all the short sellers is the amount of details that they end up in. But one question I always have is how do Asian investors short the market. I, I mean, from my understanding, because I have listened to a couple of podcasts about how Hindenburg actually has to require a very different approach to short Adani Group in the region. They have to go through some alternate instruments from Singapore to short the Indian market. 
Mm. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, some markets are not easily accessible. It can be capital mm. controls, for example, in some markets. And in, for example, China doesn't allow short selling yep. of individual shares. And That's in right. that case, you have to seek some. You have to arrange some kind of uh, derivative instrument, like P notes or something like that. Yep. But you can't short sell shares in in China, and perhaps maybe not in India either. So, but then you need a counterparty, and then you get counterparty risk, which is another issue. And I also found that if you're short short selling shares in smaller markets like Taiwan or whatever, the the borrow rates can be quite high. Whereas in the US, you can borrow for a large liquid company, yeah. just a, you know, below 1%. So that really eats into your profits. So not only do you have, you're losing out the dividends, you're also losing out on borrow. So if you're paying 10% for the borrow and also dividends, it makes it a very difficult thing to do, mm-hmm. very difficult business. And it's not impossible. I, I, you know, Hong Kong shares can be short. Can, you, can, you can sell those shares short. And Japan and such, but there are not as many short sellers active in this part of the world. That's for sure. Mm. So my cl- traditional closing question then: What does great look like for Asian stocks in the next month, decade? Is it just weeding out most of them through short sellers, or maybe really having actual business fundamentals? Well, I think that the I mentioned that in the past. You know, this outsourcing wave. It's really hard to stop, because. There's just so much talented and skilled labor in Asia. I mean, population is massive. And if China turns inwards again, there are other countries. Like, you know, there's hundreds of millions of, you know, unutilized labor in India, for example. There's just, I don't think the story is over at all. Even if China, let's say, turns inwards and closes off from the world, if that were to happen. So I do think that this, this trend is really hard to stop. Uh, and that means growth, basically. And when you do get outsourcing of manufacturing to Asia or elsewhere, let's say East, Eastern Europe, you do get these positive spillover effects like companies learning how to manufacture goods. And then they start their own brands selling into Western markets, like we saw that happen in, in Korea with Samsung or, or Japan. So that's a you know, really long-term positive trend. I think the composition of manufactured goods export is going to change towards perhaps Vietnam, but perhaps other countries, you know, to Bang- Bangladesh or India. Uh, so so that could change and there will be wealth created in that process as well. So yeah, 10 years is a long time. Markets will fluctuate, obviously, and there will be bull markets coming and going. Markets that are in favor today might be out of favor tomorrow. Like right now, Indian shares are really hot. That could change. Perhaps the Philippines... You know, those shares could, be, could become popular again. Who knows? There will be a lot of fluctuation. And th- there's also this geopolitics has become more uh, difficult. There's been a, almost a fight to control parts of Asia. You know, some are allied with the United States, perhaps Philippines, Singapore, or not. Singapore is trying to stay neutral. But, uh, you know, there's, there's almost like, I wouldn't call it the bamboo curtain, but a little bit like that an iron curtain where... Countries are getting, they're almost forming parts of blocks. And that's a little bit worrying. But other than that, there'll be continued growth in this part of the world much faster than anywhere else because of this talent and and entrepreneurship that we're seeing. Mm. Michael, many thanks for coming on the show. So in closing, I have two very quick questions to ask. Any recommendations that have recently inspired you? Inspired me? Well, I, frankly, to be perfectly honest, Perhaps that's part of my personality, a little bit cautious. And mm. I've been watching a lot of Jeff Gundlach videos. Oh, yeah. he, he's a bond, known as the Bond King, focusing on bonds. And he is uh, basically bullish on, on bonds and uh, seeing weakening of growth. Sorry to, to bring you down. Perhaps you're looking for something more positive. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it's, this mm. is the major trend, really, that we've seen these high interest rates. We're probably going to see a lowering of interest rates at some points. But first, we're going to see weakening economic growth, perhaps in the US, at some point. And uh, so I've been watching his videos really religiously the past few months, trying to figure out how this is going to play out, whether these high interest rates are going to lead to some kind of some kind of negative initially, but then positive outcome with lower interest rates. And the reason I pay so much attention to that is not because of the U.S. I'm, I frankly, I that's not a coverage market for me. But w- when you get lower interest rates, that's when you get 
potentially a lower US dollar and then inflows into Asia. Typically, Asia performs well. Asian stock markets tend to perform well when you get a low wiki dollar, stronger growth in this part of the world. And when we do see the lower, you know, lower dollar, I think per, U.S. investors will and Western investors will start to allocate more money to Asia. Right now, nobody's interested. But once that happens, once interest rates start coming down again, less reason to own U.S. dollars. And finally, you will just see some interest in this part of the world. So mm. that's what I'm hoping for. Where can my audience find you? Sure. Well, I have a website, AsianCenturyStocks.com. And if you just yeah, if you go there, you'll see exactly what I've written in the past. If you click in the center, the map there, you will see a list of everything I've written in the past and you see what's interesting you. And also you have a pretty active Twitter account, right? Or X account now, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes. X. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I will always say Twitter. I'll continue saying that. Yeah, so, same here. Yeah. Exactly. I, I am active on Twitter as well. And uh, my handle is user account is Mike Fritzell. M I E F R I T Z E L L. Yeah. Cool. And I put it in the show notes. And of course, you can find us on YouTube and every other podcast platform and also subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Michael, many thanks for coming on the show. I think we haven't even got to talking about other more interesting stocks or you know other instruments, but I will look forward to speak to you again. Thank you so much, bro.